September. Good evening, I'm Kelly Brink. And I'm Penn Bowen. Tonight's top story, position switching, switching in Russia. The Soviet Communist Party Central Committee has announced a major government shakeup. President Andrei Gromyko has retired from the ruling Politburo, and there were three other Politburo members who, purged, who were purged, and also the chief rival of Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev was demoted. The reshuffling is seen as an apparent bid by Gorbachev to cons consolidate power and lessen the influence of conservatives. Here's more explanation to that switch in positions. There had been speculation since the June party conference that Mikhail Gorbachev would eventually have to take on the old guard if his plans for change in the Soviet Union are to succeed. Today it was Gorbachev's broom sweeping out the old, including Soviet President Andrei Gromyko, who survived Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev, but was bounced off the Politburo and by his own request, relieved of the Soviet presidency, a largely ceremonial post. His is the best-known name in the West, but others, either Brezhnev-era men or opponents of Gorbachev's perestroika, lost their jobs as well, including former Soviet ambassador to Washington Anatoly Dobrynin. In his case, the meaning of his retirement is unclear. Whatever Gorbachev has in mind for his next move could be revealed tomorrow, when the huge Supreme Soviet meets in Moscow. The sudden shifts in the Soviet political earth are Gorbachev's handiwork, and it is not likely that he's finished yet. Jan Charlton, CBS News, Moscow. More shuttle news after the successful liftoff of Discovery. The crew of the shuttle Discovery is conducting scientific experiments today in orbit above the Earth. Astronaut George Nelson activated two experiments, one to obtain ultra-pure protein samples in the weightlessness of space, and another to find out if low gravity can help produce lighter, stronger metals. The astronauts are also studying the behavior of red blood cells as they complete the initial run. Here is a more in-depth look at what these experiments are doing and what the astronauts are doing out there. The Galileo mission to explore Jupiter and its largest moons. The Magellan spacecraft, providing the first detailed mapping of the planet Venus. Both missions were supposed to be launched two years ago. Today, they only fly in animation. Casualties of the shuttle Challenger disaster, an accident which has crippled U.S. space science. Well, the U.S. space science program really is in crisis. Uh, all it has in orbit are some old spacecraft. There's no flow of data, which is the lifeblood of doing science. It has been a disaster. It's a disaster for the country. It's too narrow to think of it just as impacting the lives of individual uh, space scientists. It's been a disaster for this country as a whole, not to hold that position of leadership to which this country committed in the early, in the 1960s. In a special dust-free warehouse in California designed to protect sensitive equipment hangs the Hubble telescope, an instrument scientists say may help reveal secrets of the solar system. And we think we're going to see out about as far as you can ever see, and that we're really going to learn about the early stages of the universe. How big is it? How old is it? And where is it going? The Hubble telescope was scheduled to be launched in 1986. It's now expected to remain in storage until 1990. The Challenger disaster may continue to harm the U.S. space science program well into the 1990s. NASA officials are concerned that a number of young space scientists, discouraged and frustrated by the grounding of the shuttle program, have abandoned the field. The total dependence on the shuttle as our sole means of access to space was a tragic mistake for the country, which I think uh, will have ramifications well into the 1990s. And it was the space science program that was the worst hit of all. And when the shuttle gets back into business, Defense Department payloads will have first priority, leaving the U.S. space science community wondering if it will have to turn to other nations to get its projects into space. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. Sports Illustrated magazine is saying everything is hunky-dory now that 3,000 stolen slides from the Seoul Olympics have been returned. The slides were stolen while en route to the magazine's New York City offices yesterday afternoon. They were found abandoned a couple of hours later by a Manhattan messenger. The magazine was informed of the slides' whereabouts after radio reports of the theft were aired in New York this morning. 
In Sioux City, Ron Thomas, who is a director of the local Native American Center and also a member of a new task force, a force that has been assigned to study options for re restoring the War Eagle Monument located in Sioux City. He says he has no objections to moving the statue to a nearby bluff. The historic statue that marked the grave of Sioux Indian Chief has been in storage since the last spring when it barely survived a landslide. Thomas says a nearby bluff would offer the monument more stability and would eliminate the danger of landslides. And in Storm Lake, 42-year-old Susan Johnson received a 10-year suspended sentence. Johnson, who was a Storm Lake High School secretary, was placed on a two-year probation after she pleaded guilty to stealing $7,390 from the school. Johnson was charged with second-degree theft earlier this year when $878 were stolen. The charge was changed to first-degree theft when more money was found missing. Johnson has repaid the money to the Buena Vista County School District. Although this year's early harvest will leave time for fall tillage, Iowa conservationists say the parched ground makes this fall a poor time to plow. Spokesman Jim Ayen says dry ground is especially vulnerable to wind erosion. He says fall tillage could interfere with the recharging of soil moisture. Speaking of the soil moisture, this is probably the reason we've been having so much damp weather, to prevent wind erosion, right, Penn? That's right. We have had a lot of, a lot of damp weather, and uh, if, we'll, if, you, if you'll notice, we'll, we'll take a look at the highs uh, in just a moment. Uh, as we see today's highs, uh, it was pretty warm out on the west coast. We see a, uh, a small area of 100s, and uh, most of the area, however, wasn't quite that hot. We did see a, uh, 60s and 70s throughout the central portion of the United States. And when we come back, we'll take a look at the current weather, so stay with us. McGruff here. I want you to learn a song that tells people to say no to drugs. Users and losers and losers and users. I don't use drugs. Don't use drugs. Come on. If you know a user even part of the time, tell them to quit, take a bite out of crime. Users and losers and losers are users. So I don't use drugs. Don't use drugs. Now, I'll teach it to everybody and help take a bite out of crime. You will be able to feel the pulsating power of Innovation Video as it brings you the edge in motorsports every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 645 here on Innovation Video. <laughs> and that this free society speaks with power, force, and decision. The political machine that put these people into office is still run by the same person. You. Democracy. It can't be of the people and for the people if it's not by the people. Vote. Innovation. In. Na. Fe. Shin. A noun. One. The introduction of something new. Two. A new idea, method, or device. Video. Vid, E, O. An adjective. Vidi, to see, plus O, to hear. One, being related to or used in the transmission or reception of the television image. Innovation. Video. Now you know. Okay, well, look at the current weather. Uh, you saw all kinds of sunny out weather out on the west coast. It was just beautiful out there. But uh, in the central portion of the U.S., we didn't see uh, quite the good weather that they had out on the west coast. We saw some thunderstorms, a lot of rain. Uh, uh, it's just it's just typical, I guess, for this time of the year, wet and, and wet and rainy. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to see uh, uh, an incredible change in the weather. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, the sun's going to be moving in uh, from the west. Uh, however, it is going to get a little colder. The the temperature is going to drop. So uh, with the with the warmer wet or with the sunny sun coming out, we're going to see colder temperatures. Uh, let's take a look around the area. Yesterday we saw um, uh, pretty nice temperatures. Uh, Storm Lake capped out at 71. Uh, they also were uh, the low uh, at 53. So 
it was it was uh, nice yesterday. Uh, look at the there it is 71 a year ago it was about the same 72 with a 50 of, um, as the low, and uh, today it was it was cloudy. Uh, the winds were light out of the southwest about 10 miles an hour. Uh, the high today was 63 with a low of 48. Sunrise today was at 6:55. The sunset was at. Uh, uh, 646. Tomorrow we're going to see uh, sunrise at 656 and uh, sunset at 644. Tonight uh, will be cloudy, uh, low around 48. Wind's going to be light and variable. <coughs> uh, tomorrow will be partly cloudy, however, that will be improving um, throughout the rest of the week. We're going to see uh, the sun make it an appearance, so it's going to look nice, but it's not going to feel nice. It's going to be a little colder, so uh, uh, get ready to. Uh, Feel the, the cold moving, it's moving, on, moving on in. There it is, very colder. Um, can't say too much about the sun. It's going to be great. But uh, one thing about that is that we're going to have to wear bigger sweaters. So uh, be prepared to withstand that uh, northern cold. Kelly? OK, well, I'll get my sweaters out, I guess. Thanks a lot, Penn. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, a comfortable rally on Wall Street until it started to come apart. The results dropped the Dow Industrial 6.40 to 2112.91. Still a 22 point drop or 22 advance on the week. Trade was active at 175.7 million shares, while advances led declines at 4 to 3. Well, Kathy Miller's here with the sports. Kathy, what's going on with the steroid use? I guess everyone seems to be taking them now. Well, we have another accused player today, Jose Canseco right fielder for the Oakland Athletics denies charges he has used steroids to help his baseball career. Thomas Boswell, a Washington Post columnist, alleges that Canseco used steroids to build his weight up to 50 pounds extra. The Athletics say Canseco bulked up gradually through extensive weightlifting. The Storm Lake High volleyball team takes an undefeated conference record into the weekend. This weekend is a big tournament for the Tornadoes. Brian Gillette brings us a story on the Lady Tornadoes. The Storm Lake High School volleyball team got out of the blocks in a hurry this year as the Tornadoes have absolutely blown away their first four conference opponents. The road gets tougher, however, for Coach Jeannie Henningsen's squad this weekend as they travel to Spencer for the conference tournament. Well, we are 4-0 in the conference, and we're hopefully going to go up there and put on a good showing. We are seated number one in the conference along with Spirit Lake, and hopefully the girls can get off to a good start and come back with a first place finish. The Tornado's main competition this week should come from Spirit Lake. The Indians return every starter from last year's conference champion squad. They're really good. They're, yeah, they have tall girls. They're really strong. They just have it all together. Coach Henningsen hopes to counter the Indians' strong offense with the play of her setters Jackie Bauer and Allie Ewing. Along with that, spiker Rachel Robinson says that team unity may aid the Tornadoes in their quest for conference gold. Our team is pretty much a close team because we're all friends in school and so then it helps us on the floor because if we do have a problem we can go directly to them and talk to them because we are good friends. The Tornadoes will open the tournament Saturday in Pool A opposite Spirit Lake and should both teams advance they will meet in the final that night. From Storm Lake High School for Innovation News, this is Brian Gillette. Iowa Hawkeye Marv Cook will not be playing in Saturday's game at Michigan State. Early this week, Coach Hayden Fry said team doctors gave Cook a 50-50 chance of playing this weekend. Cook is one of Iowa's captains. He's missed the last two games with a sprained ankle. In a local football game tonight, the Storm Lake Tornadoes play Cherokee. John Forte tells us what exactly this game means to both the team and the community. The Storm Lake High football team is into another season tonight. The one in three Tornadoes go up against the Cherokee Braves, and if you've grown up around Storm Lake, you know what this game means to the team and to the town. But most of all, this game is very important to the Tornadoes season. With a one in three start, the team could really use a victory to give the players some much needed confidence. Uh, this year we're off to a one and three start, which I guess nobody likes to come out of the shoot that way, but uh, we've played everyone real close pretty much. Actually, the Tornadoes are playing much better than their record indicates. Two of the three losses were by less than a touchdown. Generally, the defense has played well, but the offense has not scored since the season opener. Scott Zippel, Tornado Free Safety, knows there is light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I think we're a better team this year. Last year we were 
we had a lot of juniors that are just that were inexperienced and started. Mm -hmm. So that helped for this year because we had we got experienced people playing. I think we're gonna play. We're gonna. Our record is gonna be better than last year. We only won one game. We're running new offense this year. It's a veer, and I we just haven't been able to put it in the put in the hole. We we move it sometimes, and then or if we move the ball, we'll fumble it. Uh -huh. And we just I think it's just getting used to the new offense, um, having the backs read the holes. Sometimes we weren't reading them right, mm -hmm. and the linemen come off the ball because we're not we're not that big, a uh, really big team. team. Although the players are looking for a boost, Coach John Alaknovich has a lot of confidence in his team. Uh, probably the things we've done best this year is defense. Uh, mm -hmm. We have held the opponents down quite a bit, and uh, kids know the system pretty well. This is third year now that we've run the same defensive system, so the kids feel real confident with that. Tonight, tornadoes take on the Braves at Cherokee. We're gonna get we're gonna get Cherokee. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so that's to look in sports. Kelly, want well, to wish the tornadoes good luck. Hopefully, they can pull out a win tonight. Well, that sounds good. Good luck to the tornadoes, and also to the Buena Vista Beavers who travel to Luther to play football tomorrow. Uh, the cost of living. Our cost of your house payments got you in a bind. We'll take a trip to Rolf, Iowa, where they are giving away homes, if you can believe that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, kind of cold. Yeah. Well, I don't have anything baked, but here's some homemade tomato oh, sauce. Thank you very much. And Jason's got, it's called mock pineapple. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and these two the Mendoza family is finding out firsthand about Iowa's good old-fashioned oh. neighborliness. The Mendozas are in the process of moving in here after leaving their home in New York City. The fourth family in recent months hoping to find the good life in the small town of Rolf, Iowa. The quiet life, you know, that I, I like. Because the city is, you know, it's crazy people. Everybody's going to be crazy there, you know. It's too much people. You don't have time for nothing. <laughs> For more than a year now, the town of Rolf has been trying to attract new families to move in here with a special incentive program. It works like this. Build a new house worth at least $30,000, and the town will throw in a free lot, $1,200 cash, and a year's free pass at the local swimming pool. It appears the program is paying off. So far, with the help of some worldwide media attention, 400 people have requested more information about Rolf and its promise of a low crime rate excellent school system, uncrowded recreation facilities, and friendly people. The promise of all that's good with small-town America. You can probably relate it back to the settlers, you know, the early years where they just moved west. Let's, let's look for better opportunity. Uh, I'm not so sure the opportunity is that much better, but the quality of life and what you can offer your family is, is, is far greater than what you can get in a large city. Attracting new residents like the Mendozas is just one part of Rolf's aggressive economic plan they hope to attract new businesses here, too, to ensure that Rolf won't just survive, but will grow along with the town's new families. Dana Carden with an eye on Iowa in Rolf. Well, that's all the news for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Have a super weekend, and we'll see you again on Monday. Good night.
other in innovation news, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas 25 years ago today. Doug Jackson and Charles Osgood look back on what was and what could have been. Plus, Storm Lake gears up for the Christmas season. All this and more tonight on Innovation News. Good evening from Buena Vista College. This is Innovation Video News for Tuesday, November 22nd. Thank you for joining us. 25 years ago today, President John F. Kennedy was shot and killed as he rode in his motorcade through the streets of Dallas, Texas. Now, 25 years later, Doug Jackson takes a few minutes to reflect upon the Kennedy era. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. Ironically, a man often thought to be one of America's outstanding presidents barely won the popular vote in 1961. And although he was president for just over a thousand days, John Fitzgerald Kennedy touched the nation in such a way that 25 years after his death, we still remember. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Many did, joining the Peace Corps, in a way becoming ambassadors from the United States, teaching thousands in underdeveloped nations to reach goals they may have thought impossible. It was not long after his inauguration that Kennedy was to face a major crisis. In April, an assault by some 1,400 CIA-trained Cuban exiles was launched in the Cuban Bay of Pigs. The CIA maintained the invasion would be a signal for a popular uprising to overthrow Fidel Castro. It was wrong. Castro's Soviet-equipped forces killed or captured the exiles. Kennedy held no illusions about ending the Cold War when he met with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna several weeks later. The Russian wanted the Allies out of Berlin. Tough was how Khrushchev described the new president. Kennedy called the two-day meeting somber. They failed to reach a compromise. The Berlin Wall was built later that year. A bit over a year later, Soviet missile bases were discovered in Cuba. Kennedy ordered U.S. naval and air forces to quarantine Cuba, blocking delivery of additional weapons to the island. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The threat of nuclear war seemed a reality. Khrushchev threatened to run the blockade, but faced with Kennedy's resolve, the Soviet premier agreed to dismantle the bases. The president reinforced his position on world freedom when, in June of 1963, he viewed the Berlin Wall and reached out to identify with residents of that divided city. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest post is, Ich bin ein Berliner. Back in the United States, Americans deprived of their own freedoms were fighting back. Civil rights leaders charged the Kennedy administration was slow in responding with legislation while blacks were openly beaten in the streets. Legislation stalled in Congress and would not be realized in Kennedy's time. Kennedy sent more U.S. troops to Vietnam. Whether he would have continued the escalation or in time found another solution to the Indochina conflict falls in that category of what might have been. Kennedy's strength and style made a lasting impression on those he met. One could imagine he was as at ease with world leaders as he was with the press, as in this exchange about a record produced by writer Vaughn Meter mimicking the first family. Can you tell us uh, whether you read and listen to these things and whether they produce annoyment or enjoyment? <laughs> Annoyment. Uh, no, they produce. I, yes, I have read them and listened to them. Actually, I listened to Mr. Meader's record, but I thought it sounded more like Teddy than it did me. But uh. <laughs> not lost on the nation were those intimate moments with the first family when little Caroline strolled into one of her father's news conferences in her mother's shoes. Or John John scrambling in and out of helicopters. What was lost on that November day in Dallas was the man. What remain are the ideals and the words Come that even today can stir the nation. State. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. 
that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Palestine Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat said in Cairo today that the United States has agreed to grant him an entry visa. He also plans to address the UN General Assembly. However, there was no immediate confirmation from the United States on that report. Arafat says 54 countries have recognized the Palestinian state he proclaimed November 15th at a meeting of the Palestine National Council. Along with that, police sources in Lebanon say the Israeli Air Force destroyed two Palestinian guerrilla bases in southern Lebanon, killing four people and wounding eight others. The sources said five low-flying Israeli warplanes made two bombing runs over the Palestinian refugee camp on the outskirts of a port city in Sidon. The search has come to a cl close for the disappearance of the Simpson College coach. coach. Police in Indianola have ended their investigation. Police say Steve Wilbur called his parents in Indianola last night. He is apparently safe. Officers say his name has been removed from the state's list of missing people. They say the reason for his disappearance is apparently a family matter, not a police situation. The assistant football coach and sports information director vanished November 13th, leaving his wallets and most belongings behind. Officials at first suspected foul play and conducted an aerial and ground search of Warren County looking for clues. And in Sioux City, the officials are concerned about pollution found in two backup drinking water wells. Traces of an industrial solvent called TCE were found in the reserve wells that were used during the water short summer months. Officials say that TCE could be coming from a variety of places. Some of the ideas the officials had were the old city landfill, the asphalt plant, and the dry cleaning businesses. Federal and states' highways in Iowa are the most likely to be sites of crashes during the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday. This conclusion came from a study done by the Iowa Department of Transportation. A look at the previous five holidays shows 71% of the fatal accidents occur on primary highways, while only 17% happen on county roads. During the holidays, please buckle up and drive safely. Another hurricane is coming our way. Tropical Storm Keith is heading for the Florida West Coast. The National Hurricane Center predicts Keith will make landfall early tomorrow, packing wind gusts of up to 65 miles an hour and heavy rain. At last report, Keith was 285 miles west-southwest of Fort Myers. Along with the weather in Florida, Kevin Sullivan is here with the national weather as well as the storm-like weather. How's it going to be looking for Thanksgiving for us, Kevin? It looks like it's going to be nice and clear, but watch out for Friday and Saturday. You could have rain or snow. There's a good chance of, uh, like I said, a rain and snow going here, but in most of the rest of the country, everything looks pretty good, actually. <clears throat> As you can see, here in the Midwest, we've got uh, temperatures of the 40s, and um, it's going to look like that pretty much through the weekend, and we'll have more after this. Dear No Format Show, I watched an episode of your show and I didn't understand any of it. What's the deal? Signed, confused. They're confused. There's no deal here. We don't charge you anything for the No Format Show. It's free on your TV. As for understanding it, well, we don't even understand it. That's why we show it twice a week. Tuesdays at 7.35 and Thursdays at 7.05, right here on Innovation Video. When I asked you to stop, it's because I love you. But there isn't any problem. There is. You've changed. Changed? What do you mean changed? All I do is a little cocaine. A little? I want you to stop. That's it. I want you to take that coke and flush it down the toilet. It's 250 bucks worth. I won't do it. All I want to do is help you. You say you love me and I love you too. God, I don't know what else to do. When you can't help, call someone who can help you help. Watch Picture Puzzle and meet interesting people like Corey Zart. 
Hi, I'm Corey Zart. I play football for the University of Beaver Football. I play Rose Garden for BV College Football. So watch Picture Puzzle every Monday at 8.35, Wednesday at 7.05, and Friday at 8.05, here on Innovation Video. When friends don't stop friends from drinking and driving. Friends die from drinking and driving. Friends die from drinking and drinking and driving can kill a friendship. Welcome back. Now, as you can see, over most of the Midwest down here, we got lots of sunshine, which is very nice. And all this rain over here and snow, all this precipitation is eventually going to work its way down through here. And we'll be seeing that on the weekend. Let's take a look at the current, the local temperatures across the state of Iowa, um, if we can get them. Oh, look at we got Wednesday afternoon. Oh, yeah, here you can see it's progressing down through here, coming closer to Iowa. And we still got our sunshine here. Okay. And let's see. Here we go. Okay. Across the state of Iowa in Ames, we've got 36 degrees. Storm Lake, 42. Uh, Cedar Rapids, 28. Council Bluffs, 50. Des Moines, 39. Dubuque, 27. Sioux City, 43. And Spencer, 38. And you can see we got a low of 8 in Spencer. That's a cold spot across the state. And uh, yesterday's high of, was uh, 37 with a low of 13. A year ago, a high of 52 with a low of 19. And today we got mostly sunny skies, as you realized today and a high of 42 if a low of 31 and the winds out of south southwest five miles an hour and less it was really light winded out there today and barometer 30 uh, look at that we got sunrise 650 sunset 443 tomorrow sunrise will be 651 with a sunset of 442 and let's take a look at tonight's weather we're going to have clear skies of a low of 30s and the wind is still going to be out of the southwest uh, south southwest it is at five miles per hour and tomorrow, mostly sunny and warmer. It's going to be a high of 50s, hopefully, and up in the 50s. And a low, again, will be in the 30s. And the wind will still be out of the southwest at, at 10 miles an hour. Um, Thursday through Saturday, the extended forecast. It's, we're going to have a good Thanksgiving. It's going to be uh, good weather there. But we can expect to have, as I said once again, Friday and uh, Saturday, w maybe snow or rain. The, the chance is going to be there. We're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Well, Kelly, back to you. Well, thank you very much for that nice weather report for Thanksgiving. I'll look forward to it. As the Christmas season approaches after Thanksgiving, Storm Lake is gearing up to celebrate the holiday. Here is Innovation News reporter Lance Herbal with a report on the annual Santa Village display. Preparing for the holiday season in most towns means decorating street lamps. In Storm Lake, however, the holidays mean a lot more. Thanksgiving Day marks the opening of Santa's Village, a major attraction in Northwest Iowa. Santa's Village is a collection of animated figures that were formerly used as store window displays. The City Chamber of Commerce has purchased these mechanical toys over the past 28 years. Some of the attractions include a nanny goat checking her kids, Santa's reindeer, and of course Santa Claus himself will be on hand. Santa's Village is sponsored by the St Storm Lake City Chamber of Commerce and will run through New Year's Eve day. The village will be open weekday afternoons from 2 to 4 and weekends from 1 to 4. After December 5th, the village will be open weeknights 6.30 to 8 o'clock in the evening. Be watching Innovation News next week when we have a follow-up after opening day. For Innovation News, this is Lance Herbold reporting. Investors spent the greater part of today trying to decide if the increased October consumer prices mean that inflation is returning and the interest rates are going up. After reviewing the rates, however, they decided against the idea of returning inflation causing a problem. The Dow Jones Industries gained 11.763 to 2,077.70 in a last-minute rally. Moderate trade was at 127 million shares and advances led declines by 12 issues. Missy Stump is here with the sports. Miss, what's going on in football? 
Well, the UPI released the 1988 All-Big Ten football team today, and Iowa's tight end Marv Cook and quarterback Chuck Hartley were named to the first team offense, along with offensive tackle Bob Cratch. On defense, linemen Dave Haight and Joe Mott were named to the first team, as well as standout linebacker Brad Quast. Center Bill Anderson was given an honorable mention. And Iowa State had five players named on the Big 8 coaches' all-star teams. Linebacker Mike Shane and kicker Jeff Shudek were named to the first team units, while running back Joe Henderson, tight end Mike Bush, and defensive back Ray Carruthers were named to the second team. Receiving honorable mentions were wide receivers Dennis Ross, offensive guard Keith Sims, and defensive backs Jeff Dole and Marcus Robertson. Nebraska dominated the first team units with 11 players picked for the honor. Iowa's Ed Horton scored 30 points, and Roy Marble chipped in with 29 to lead Iowa to a 118-107 victory over Athletes in Action at Carver Hawkeye Arena in Iowa City yesterday. Iowa never trailed in the ball game and led it by as much as 19 points in the first half to force a 65-54 halftime lead. However, the AIA's Lorenzo Romar shaved the Hawkeyes' lead to 8 points with 142 remaining in the final period. But Iowa hit some key free throws down the stretch to seal the win. Saturday, the Hawks host McNessie State for its regular season opener. And University of Missouri coach Woody Widenhofer has resigned following a disappointing 3-7-1 season with the Tigers. Widenhofer issued a statement to reporters yesterday thanking his team and coaches for, quote, hanging in there, but declined to answer any further questions. UNI head coach Earl Bruce is one of those being considered for the position. Bruce said yesterday that the Missouri job is a good one, but that it's too early for him to make a decision on whether to apply for it. So, look forward to that Thanksgiving football, and see you again on Monday, Cal. Well, that sounds good. As we close tonight with, re with Charles Osgood's reflections on what might have been had President Kennedy lived, we mourn the loss of Kennedy. We here at Innovation Video wish all of you a safe and happy Thanksgiving. See you Monday night at 6.30. Good night. Good night. He wanted the word to go forth on the first of his thousand days as president that the torch had been passed to a new generation of Americans. That was the torch he wanted us to contemplate. Not this one. 25 years have come and gone. And were he still alive, John Kennedy would be 71 now. How would he look today? Would he be surprised to see how much has changed in this country and this world? How would he feel about it all? We cannot say. You have to be at least in your 30s to remember John Kennedy. For anyone younger, he is a page in the history books, a face on a coin, a name for a school or a library or an office building, a space center or an airport. What would he think of that? We have no way of knowing. But those of us old enough recall a human John Kennedy, a handsome, smiling man of intelligence, charm, wit, and grace. No saint, perhaps, not one who would have willingly chosen martyrdom, but the choice was not his to make. Many doors slammed shut that day. We have had five presidents since then and are about to have a sixth. Would they have been different men? Would history have played out differently in Vietnam, in Moscow, in Beijing? Could we have addressed human rights here at home without those long, hot summers? And would we ourselves somehow be different people now if John Kennedy had not been killed? We will never know. It is as John Greenleaf Whittier wrote, for of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world.
Tonight on Innovation Video News, Eastern Airline Machinist received the day off, but not for favorable conditions. The Smith Dawson Lumber Company experienced an extreme loss, and once again, Storm Lake receives a large taste of winter. All this and more tonight on Innovation Video News. Good evening, I'm Darcy Krugel. And I'm Jennifer Gilg. Live from Buena Vista College, Innovation Video brings you the news for Friday, March 3rd. What appears to be a goodwill gesture at Eastern Airlines isn't. Machinists at the airlines are getting the day off with pay. Eastern sent the workers home this morning saying it heard the machinists plan to disable the airline's fleet by delopping de de the emergency evacuation chutes on planes if they end up walking off the job. The machinists are planning to strike at one minute past midnight tonight unless President Bush intervenes or last minute negotiations resolve the lengthy contract dispute. Could Oliver North's trial be forced to a dismissal? Possibly. Today, U.S. District Judge Gazelle was forced to consider the dismissal. The judge will hear from defense attorneys who contend the restrictions on national secrets at the proceedings are violating North's rights to a fair trial. However, it's considered unlikely that Gazelle would grant the request two weeks into the trial. In another Washington, D.C. courtroom, another issue in relation to the Iran-Contra affair will be decided sometime today. Robert McFarland faces a possible four-year sentence for lying to Congress about his activities in the worst political scandal of the Reagan administration. The former National Security Advisor pleaded guilty to four misdemeanor counts last year. Calm is being restored to Venezuela's Vela's capital after, after a night of sporadic shooting in outlying neighborhoods. Witnesses say the shooting stopped after troops moved in. President Carlos Andres Perez said today that more than 300 people died and up to 2,000 were wounded in four days of rioting that erupted in Caracas over an unpopular government austerity program. The battle heated up today during Senate debate on the nomination of John Tower to be Defense Secretary. Republican John Warner of Virginia said Tower's fate should be decided on fairness, not rumor and innuendo. While Georgia Democrat Sam Nunn also commented on Tower's issue, saying that the debate is not a trial and that the Senate cannot treat it as such. Just an added note on the same issue, the Senate agreed today that they still have a few members who drink too much. However, there's general agreement that fewer senators today hit the bottle as hard as their pre 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 predecessors. There's even an Alcoholics Anonymous chapter that meets in the Capitol building. Israel is asking the United States to end contra contacts with the Palestinian Liberation Organization because of reported guerrilla attempts to cross into northern Israel. Four Palestinians were killed south in southern Lebanon yesterday. The Israeli army says they carry documents that indicated that they plan to attack a civilian target. West German authorities issued an arrest warrant today for a member of a spy ring believed to have solved the Soviets to have sold the Soviets information how to break into the Pentagon, computers and other key data banks. A West German prosecutor says investigators are trying to determine how much information was passed on to the KGB. A top government official in Bonn says he considers it a grave affair, but he says he does not think the security of the West is endangered. In Albany, New York, a state panel reviewed the parole request from B Bernard Goetz. The board decided to deny the request for the early release for the subway gunman who was convicted of gun possession charges and in shooting a four-use on a New York City subway train. 
in his application would have been granted, he would have been freed from prison after serving only 51 days of a one-year sentence. If you're worried about pesticides contaminating fresh fruits, you're just one of many. According to the Des Moines Register, John Moore, the acting deputy administrator of EPA, said his agency was receiving phone calls from many fearful and angry consumers about the possible links between pesticide residues and cancers. However, the top administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency stated on Thursday, that the nation's food supply is the safest in the world. Twelve European countries have decided to try and improve the ozone layer instead of polluting it. In an unexpectional strong move yesterday, the twelve countries agreed to eliminate by the end of the century all production and use of chemicals that harm the atmosphere's ozone shield. Many officials of the Bush administration said that they will strongly urge President Bush to endorse a worldwide phase-out of the chemicals. And not enough can be said about the hard work that goes into a family business. And unfortunately for Smith, Dawson Lumber, that hard work was wiped out. A roaring ball of flames rolled out to meet firefighters. Stacks of wood fueled those flames. A whole block was up in smoke. You could see it for miles. Not all firefighters could do was douse it with water. Extra companies were brought in, but still the fire just had to burn itself out. Smith Dodson Lumber is a family-owned business started in 1941, and you can imagine the loss of a business that's passed down through generations. It was really shock. It didn't really sink in until I got here and saw all these flames. I thought it could have been controlled up here. It was on the one end, and then by the time I walked around front, it was like spreading through the whole building. So it was just shock and disbelief. I just can't say enough for how good a job the firemen did, what they saved. Uh, a lot of machinery was saved. You could hear some of it burning up with muffled explosions. Everyone nearby was sent scrambling. Not too far away, people who came in to watch. I was afraid that maybe it was some of our neighbors, and I thank God it wasn't. I hope there wasn't anybody hurt in here. Our hearts go out to them. A couple of firefighters were hurt. Minor injuries like spraining ankles while dragging hoses. Burning embers flew through the air, and our Skycam pilot helped firefighters spot houses where they landed to stop other fires. Firefighters expect to be here through morning, and although they're not sure exactly what caused the fire, an arson investigator says an electrical problem may be one cause that they're looking into. All but the office burned to the ground. Now the family will begin rebuilding. Oh, we keep going. I don't see why not. We can build it back. We started once. Cheryl Sheets, Eyewitness News. us at private colleges will feel the pain of a tuition increase next year, those students at state universities won't. The Iowa House approved a measure yesterday, 62 to 32, that will freeze undergraduate resident tuition during the 1990 and 91 school year. Also included is that in the subsequent three years, state university tuition could rise no faster than an inflation index that is based on higher education costs in Iowa. And tonight, Ann Gisbold is joining us with the weather, and she's joining us from the J. Leslie Rollins, Rollins Stadium. We have her right outside with that snow. Have we switched? Am I on? Okay, we're here live, and it's uh, obviously snowing, and we wanted to tell you there is a winter weather advisory out tonight for uh, northern and central Iowa. We'll be back with more news and weather after this, these messages. I don't. On this side, this one. Carol, you might uh, want to ask him, tell him to some people stuff. still don't realize how space technology benefits everyone. Sorry. Well, you played a detective. Why don't you give him a clue and I'll be your helper. Okay, partner. Look at this. 
Without warning, hurricanes can take a huge toll in lives and property. But with space satellites, we now have ample warnings. And thousands of lives have been saved. Are we doing? Hey, I assume Carol, we're, we're a great team. To, too? We're a great we're item. Do a zoom? Space technology. This is what's in it for you. Thanks to these airbags here, this job is now a piece of okay, cake, Claire. But then... Yeah, I'll tell you something, partner. I just might stick around a few more years. But Vince... No more dashboard du jour or Vince under glass, huh? But Vince... Look out! <laughs> Even with airbags, Vince, you still gotta remember to buckle your safety belt. Now you tell me. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. On Picture Puzzle, you'll meet interesting people who enjoy playing picture puzzle, deep sea diving, watching Days of Our Lives, picnics, spending time on my senior year with my friends, drawing, skydiving, mountain climbing, <laughs> tackling quarterbacks, bananas, playing football in the snow, and soft little fur things, the great whipped cream and warm winters, mm. burn out on Wednesday nights, football, puppies, and world peace, ice cream, fire weights, I like Picture Puzzle. Good. Tomorrow, snow will continue, but as you can see, there's a definite clearing coming from the west. And um, this, there's sun on the west coast, as you can tell. And um, as you know, Iowa Department of Public Safety provides recorded information of roads conditions, and you can call long distance if you're not in Des Moines. The area code is 515. The phone number is 288. 1047. Yesterday's area's temps. We ranged from 20, a high of 20 to a low of zero. Um, and with a 13 and 13 high and low for Iowa, for Storm Lake, which means we didn't change much here. Yesterday, a recap of yesterday, as I said before, it was 13 and 13 with the high a year ago, a high of 32 and a low of 18 which tells you that we're getting a little closer to where we need to be. Today, the sky is cloudy, the high of 23, and as you can tell, there's a lot of rain, cold sleet and rain, icy cold coming in. Uh, the low was 7. Sunrise, sunset. Today, it was uh, 6.54 for sunrise. Tomorrow, only 6.52. Tonight, it was 6.13, which was too bad for me, and tomorrow, it's 6.14. Tonight, there's cloudy, uh, Sleet and snow, as you can tell, and the lows in the teens, the highs in the 30s, 70% chance of no snow. Tomorrow will be cloudy with 20 to 25 as a temp with 50% chance of snow. Extended outlook. Three day, it's a 30% chance of rain, snow, possible snow, um, and a high of 20 to 30. And that's the weather for this uh, evening. Thank you. Glad, Anne, for bringing us that live weather report. The World Health Organization says reported cases of AIDS around the world rose by 2,008 in February. That brings the world total to 141,894. Officials say the probable total of AIDS victims is at least twice that and possibly three times higher because many African and Latin American countries lack facilities to trace and diagnose all cases. If you're planning on visiting Stonehenge for the summer solace this year, don't. Officials said yesterday that the ancient monument will be closed to the public for the summer. The action was taken reluctantly on the advice of, of the police who have had to cope with thousands of rowdy celebrants each, each June. The Dow investors kept rally pressures going on Wall Street during the day after the market stumbled at the outset. The Dow Industrials finally gained 8.58 to 2,274.29, an active trade of 152.5 million shares. And Jennifer Gilg is joining us this evening with the sports. Jennifer, lots of sports action. That's right, a lot of BV sports action. Three Beaver wrestlers have advanced to the second round of the NCAA Division III wrestling tournament at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. Third seeded Dave Jordan defeated Wartburg's Mike Powell in a close 6-5 decision in the 118-pound category. In the 126-pound division, Kurt Chessmore dominated Rhode Island Tech's Brian Hart 9-2, and BV, BV's Rick Caldwell easily defeated Potsdam Dave Vinson, 7-2 in the 190-pound category. 
The t other two Beaver wrestlers lost in the preliminary rounds, but have started action in the Consolation Wrestlebacks. So far, Brian Boss advanced over Matt Opisite from Trenton, and Jeff Bakken will wrestle sometime tonight or tomorrow morning. Second round action will resume later tonight, and Innovation Video will bring you the complete story of the tournament on Monday. The World Indoor Track and Field Championships open today in Budapest. The United States got off to an explosive start when American Roger Kingdom edged Britain's Colin Jackson on a last stride to win the men's 60-meter hurdles. Holland's Nellie Kuman won the women's 60 meters, and Britain's John Regis scored a surprise victory in the men's 200 meters. In college basketball, the Iowa State Cyclones will end their regular season at home tomorrow when they play Kansas State in Hilton Coliseum. The Cyclones are 6-7 and seven in the conference and are coming off their first Big 8 road win of the season. The Cyclones handily defeated Colorado in Boulder this week, 83-68. But Iowa State faces a bigger challenge against Kansas State, a team they could face again in the Big 8 tournament next week. Also tomorrow, top-ranked Arizona v visits UCLA, fourth-ranked Oklahoma plays at Nebraska, and number 7 Missouri hosts Colorado. And there's now a new way to increase cardiovascular fitness and reduce injuries, but you may have to get your feet wet. It's called the Wet Vest, an ultralight, flexible vest with incredible buoyancy. You can actually walk in water. Jack Ryan, Aquatic Center Director at the University of Alabama, demonstrates water running. Start moving your legs faster, but you want to try to, in, to maintain a stride forward so you're pushing water back with the bottom of your foot. Unlike life-saving vests, the wet vest was designed for exercising in the water, providing maximum support and freedom for arm and leg movements. For people who've been injured, this vest could be a real lifesaver. Using it, a person can stay physically fit. I think the real benefit of the vest is that it allows people who are injured to maintain cardiovascular fitness in the water while they're rehabilitating their injury. Eric Fine, a university student who is disabled, gives it a shot. Lay on your back, yeah, and then bring your hands up your body, and then put them out to the side and push down. And don't think you won't get a good workout. What does that do for your, for your heart? And make your pants? Exhausting. <laughs> After the laps, Ryan explains the benefits. You're not overdoing it and getting tired too quickly. You'll be able to work out for 20 to 30 minutes of doing laps like that, which will give you an incredible cardiovascular workout. In Tuscaloosa, this is Mike Lee for CBS News. So we'll be seeing a lot more BB wrestling action this weekend. Okay, we'll look forward to that story on Monday then. Thanks, Jen. And if you're into buying T-shirts, pins, and other sporting paraphernalia, then you might want to consider buying an inflatable banana. Manchester City fans turned up for their match against West Brom last night, clutching their fruit and vowing not to be parted from their inflatables, whether London clubs liked it or not. The craze started here with a player called Imri Varadi. Supporters started calling him Imri Banana. Some wag in the uh, crowd one day called him Henry Banana, and somebody just brought a banana in and it's just spread from there, as far as I remember. The commercial possibilities have been spotted quickly. Real bananas have been brandished sometimes to taunt black players, but the inflatables have no sinister intent. But it's not just bananas. As well as oranges, we spotted several crocodiles and other assorted creatures. Skeletons are apparently also a popular line. This stall holder had sold over 300 pounds worth of produce in an hour's trading. Don't you think that that is funny, Mr. Shushab? Hey, what, what's wrong with that? Hey. Well, we've got blow-up skeletons, we've got blow-up dinosaurs, gorillas, anything that'll bring a little bit of fun back to the game. That's all for the news this evening. Thanks for joining us, and try to stay out of that weather. Have a good night. Good night.